you're tempted, aren't you? Because this generation of Polo GTI is basically like a shrunken down Golf GTI, but for thousands of dollars less. So surely it's a bargain. But you've heard the rumors and you've tried to ignore them, haven't you? Like horror stories about these things doing all sorts of terrible things. And as much as you try to ignore them, they just keep chipping away at your brain. Like those like late night text messages from your ex. Like you try to ignore them, but you know you really should face up to the realities of them because something terrible might happen if you keep ignoring them. So let's get some clarity and answer some questions about this once and for all about the Polo GTI. You're on your own with the X. Now guys, in this video, we're gonna be focusing primarily on the 2010 to 2017 Mark V Polo GTI. But the important thing to know with this generation is that it basically had kind of like a, a large stint in rehab around 2014. Well, many vehicles' mid-cycle updates generally include a few tech updates and the usual cosmetic nip and tuck. Volkswagen basically conducted automotive open-heart surgery with the little GTI, swapping out the 1.4-litre twin-charged four-cylinder for a 1.8-litre turbo. They also changed the transmission to suit, and also the steering suspension and the whole chassis also saw a few tweaks as well. Now, just on these engines, that 1.4-litre twin-charge uses both a turbo and a supercharger, and that engine won multiple Engine of the Year awards when it was new. But these days, how do I put this? Um, you know how like many years ago there was a, another German that when they started seemed to be just very complex and let's be honest, a bit interesting, but then as the years went on, it turned out they, that they were like pure evil. The same can sort of be said for that 1.4 litre twin charge. Now look, we'll elaborate more on this later, but also don't think the turbocharged 1.8 litre gets away unscathed because it is also forming quite the reputation as well. Also, if you're looking into tuning one of these, especially the post update 1.8 litre, Volkswagen had to limit the torque on the DSG transmissions because apparently the six speed manual is just more robust and can handle a few more horses under the bonnet. As well as these two main generations, known as the 6R and 6C, the GTI also received other minor updates in 2012 and 2016. And depending on where you're watching this from, there were also a few tasty option packs available too. Now guys, if you're looking at buying one of these, or really any car, chances are you're gonna have to pay for it. And that brings us to a very convenient and subtle segue. Now, if you'd love to spend potentially hours talking to a complete stranger about your personal finances, maybe get ripped off hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, and just get ripped off emotionally and financially, don't click that driver link down there. But if you would like to sort out your car finance easily online, get pre-approval in just minutes, and pick the best finance package that best suits your needs, and also get 150 bucks worth of free fuel, then do click on that driver link down there. But we're not done, because we still have more bills to pay, but let's get you guys some more deals. Hit the wiper tech link down there, and go and get yourself some of the best wipers that we've ever used. They're easy to order online, they're delivered straight to your door, they're easy to fit, and they fit perfectly. Plus, use that link and you're gonna get 15% off and free express shipping. But back to the car, and let's talk looks. For me, Volkswagen have always nailed that, that balance between, you know, kind of hot hatch aesthetics, but at the same time, it's still kind of cool, classy, and sophisticated. Like, this is obviously a fun little car, but at the same time, I wouldn't be embarrassed to show it to my in-laws. However, some claim that these are just a bit too boring and a bit too understated for what they're supposed to be. Some also say that there are a whole bunch of like gremlins and problems lurking with this body and exterior, but we'll answer those questions soon. But the big question with the exterior is what is its TBTL factor? For those that don't know, TBTL is when you, you know, lock the car, walk away and turn back to look. What is the factor? For me, I give it about a, I'm gonna go 6.3. TBTL, 6.3. Okay, now inside, this is where the Polo GTI, for me at least, becomes even more appealing. Of this sort of generation of compact hot hatches, this thing, this wins for design and just overall vibe. And that's because like everything that you touch and deal with just feels premium. Like the, the steering wheel feels premium, the seats are so comfortable, and the materials used are great. Like there are some hard scratchy plastics here and there, but you're never gonna touch them. But things that you actually deal with feel top notch. Also, it doesn't feel like this is a small car, but it, it doesn't feel small in here. Again, Volkswagen designers nail this. It feels it doesn't feel spacious, but it doesn't feel like a claustrophobic big little compact car at all. Now, as far as some of the materials used, this car has the Alcantara and leather option fitted, but with the tartan interiors, I'm gonna be honest here, if you don't like the tartan interiors, 
you don't have a soul. It's just fun and cool. And if you don't like it, you're neither of those things. And then like, even speaking of the seats, it's a bit like the exterior design. It's this perfect balance between sporty, yet still sophisticated and cool. Like they're unbelievably supportive, but also really comfortable. Also, I feel like after a few years and many thousands, thousands of kilometers, the squidge in the foam has actually kind of softened up even more. I drove one of these as a press car when they first came out, and the seats were great back then, but this one, it's so comfortable. And also, heaps of adjustability. Some of the other compact cars or compact hot hatches in this category, like the Fiesta ST, and I know this from experience because I owned one, there wasn't enough seat adjustability in this, heaps. Now, as far as wear and tear goes in this particular car, obviously this is going to vary depending on which Polo GTI you're looking at, but Pete, the absolute legend that lent us this one, he uses it all the time. Wear and tear is superb. Like, okay, steering wheel texture is getting a little bit smooth, but it's still at that point where it could probably be restored. The seats, like the Alcantara and leather is in fantastic condition. All the plastics look good. It's wearing really nicely. Door cards are good. Well, there's a few tiny little, you know, tiny nicks and scratches here and there, but that'd be easily fixed with a detail. Wear and tear in this one, excellent. Now, practicality-wise, excellent. You've got two cup holders here, which will also easily fit your phone. There's also a dedicated spot for your phone behind there. There's a spot for, I don't know, a collection of dust and fingernails and bits of dried flesh and hair just here. Another spot kind of for your phone next to the handbrake. The armrest is adjustable in height, and there's also more storage under there. Really, really good size glove box, excellent size door bins, and the coolest things of all, hidden drawers under the seats, which are pretty bloody big under both seats as well. Good for practicality. Okay, now in the back seat, I'm exactly 11 centimeters taller than celebrity polo player Sylvester Stallone. Like, seriously, he is a celebrity polo player. His dad was actually like a professional polo player back in the day. Anyway, this is in my driving position, and it's interesting. So, obviously, no real knee room. I've got to do like a full OnlyFans style leg spread to even fit in here. With the headrests down, it's honestly bloody uncomfortable. With the headrest up, it's marginally better, but even kind of like the angle is a bit odd. Like I'm almost like my hips, my leg, because my legs are up so high, I'm at kind of more than 90 degrees. Is that acute? That's like an acute angle. So just, yeah, it's not that comfy. Also, because it's dark in here, like the headline is dark, it does feel a bit claustrophobic. Look, if, if I was a kid, this would be great, but I'm clearly not a kid. Now, wear and tear wise in the back of this particular car, superb like the seats especially the, the alcantara i don't think anyone's ever ever sat back here and then practicality in the back seat you've got a couple of map pockets back here you've got a brilliant design this is their cup holder and it's integrated so nicely into the center console there so that's the center console isn't it yeah um there are door bins but to get to them you're going to have to dislocate your wrist and your elbow because like there's no way you can get there and also the door bins are tiny they're crap they're for things that have two dimensions at best now, as far as practicality in the boot goes, it's okay. It's not the biggest in its class. It's not the smallest in its class. It's average. Also, the seats do fold sort of kind of flat, so you can get a bit more space. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm gonna put the headrest down. Ah! Yeah. Nice place for a picnic. Now, as far as tech and features go, look, officially this generation of Polo GTI, it never came with Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. But here's the thing, in the post-update models, obviously the ones with this style of screen, apparently you can fit Apple CarPlay and Android Auto without changing the screen out. Like, obviously, if you want a larger, more modern screen, or if we're talking a pre-update GTI, then you will be looking into fitting a new screen and updating the entire system. But if you are going to do that, guys, please use quality equipment because we've heard some horror or read some horror stories regarding cheap like eBay or Alibaba items causing all sorts of electronic drums, draining batteries and like causing major faults. But aside from that, early Polo GTIs come with all the usual stuff like aircon, power windows and mirrors and central locking. But from 2012, Bluetooth, climate control, rain sensing wipers and a touch screen were included. And then the 2014 update, it included this larger screen that we mentioned before and a whole bunch of other stuff. Plus there were the options like the driver assistance package and the 
luxury package that included everything from parking sensors and a rear view camera to leather and Alcantara trim like this car, LED headlights, a sunroof, heated front seats amongst a host of other features. And guys, for all of the specifics on all of this sort of stuff, jump on Redriven.com and check out our awesome and completely free Redriven cheat sheet. It will answer all of your deep, dark questions. Now look, safety wise, like this is a really small performance car and in the hands of the wrong people, it can turn into a bit of a disaster. But as far as the car goes, it's gonna do its best to keep you on the black stuff. But to take you through exactly what safety features these things have, as these cars are very popular with, let's say, a younger demographic, we're gonna do this next voiceover in a place that's, it's a, it's a very familiar scenario and location for, for those people. Hi. Hey. Hey, hey you, you wanna know something? Uh, yeah, sure, I guess. So like, even for launch, the Polo GTI had ABS, traction control, electronic stability control, and six airbags. But after the update, and obviously this will vary on the year model on the specific car, but you can get multi-collision braking, driver fatigue detection, and extended electronic differential. But you know what's stupid? Even though the standard Polo could come with adaptive cruise control, like the GTI, it couldn't. What? Oh, I said even though the standard Polo could come from launch. Oh, I, I just saw my friends. Bye. Okay. Bye. Again, guys, for all of the details, redriven.com, check out the cheat sheet. Okay, so this is a 2016 DSG model mini. It has the 1.8 litre engine, and Pete that owns this, like many Polo GTI owners, has given it a little bit of a, a boost in power. It has pretty much a stage one tuning kit on it. So, what's it like to drive? Let's break this down. Okay, so engine-wise, for those that don't know, the 1.8 litre in this is basically a smaller displacement version of the 2 litre that's in the you know, Golf GTI, Golf R, a whole bunch of Volkswagen products. And it's a fantastic engine, like power-wise, really smooth and linear. With the um, Stage 1 kit on this, it is, like, it's properly quick. It's not, like, terrifyingly fast, but because the car is so small and nimble, it feels faster than like a Golf GTI or a Golf R or anything like that. Really, really nice power plant. However, as you're gonna see coming up in this video, this engine is still guilty of some issues. So when you start kind of having a bit of a go, I just personally have this kind of hint of stress bugging me that something horrible might go wrong under the bonnet. Okay, the Achilles heel of these cars, these DCT transmissions. Look, around town, yeah, it's a little bit clumsy. Even with software updates, I've driven a few of these, and even with a software update, it's still a bit like jerky and not really knowing what it's doing at around town kind of functionality. Once you're going quickly, especially like on a track or having a bit of a punt on like a deserted winding road, fantastic transmission. But again, it's that whole thing of just being concerned that something might go horribly wrong with it and that detracts from the enjoyment of it. Now, as far as the ride quality goes, this is an area that this car definitely, I think, dominates some of its competition. The ride's quite good. Like, it is still energetic and kind of a little bit bouncy, and you know, it doesn't bounce all over the place, but it, it feels alive, but it is far more comfortable than, say, a Fiesta ST. The only area that, like, the Fiesta ST or a Clio RS beats this really is, like, when you really push it really hard, I did find on track these tend to kind of fall over once you pass to kind of eight or nine tenths. Those two just continue to shine. But honestly, how often are you going to do that? For day-to-day -day duties, this is the one. Now handling wise, look, if you really push hard, it's going to understeer like pretty much most modern cars, but it is a lot of fun. There are a couple of criticisms, but number one, when you turn like any of the stability stuff off, which you never should on a public road, but let's say you're going to a track day, it's never really all the way off. It's always gonna, the kind of safety net is always there, which is a good thing, but if you really wanna go hard, can be just annoying. And also, and I know I say this on a lot of our videos, I just don't know what it is with Volkswagen steering. The steering just feels numb and lifeless. Like obviously you turn this and it changes, it changes the direction of the car, but, it's not involving. Again, I always use this same analogy, but it feels like a kind of cheap Logitech gaming console steering wheel. Now, plenty of owners have complained of like heaps of rattles and squeaks and weird noises in these. In this particular one, none. Like none at all. Like I've been over some kind of harsh roads, but it sounds super tight. There's nothing going wrong in here at all. That's not always the case with Polo GTIs, but. 
Look, so overall, what is a used Polo GTI like to drive? Look, full transparency here, I was fortunate enough to do some driving for a particular magazine ages ago with this versus a Fiesta ST versus a Clio RS. It was like a group test for a magazine shoot. And back then, I, I remember thinking, this just didn't do it for me. Like, so much so that I actually went and bought a Fiesta ST after that shoot. This just felt a bit kind of, I don't know, almost dead, like a bit lifeless. But the thing is, these days, maybe this is just me getting older and more sensible. Like, with having the Fiesta ST, great car, but the suspension and just kind of feeling it, honestly, a little bit cheap and nasty after a while, the novelty wore off. Driving this around, this is the nicer thing to live with. This is a far better everyday car than pretty much any other compact hot hatch out there. And yeah, maybe I'm just getting old and boring, but yeah, it's bloody lovely to drive, yet still fun enough. It's a great compromise, like the entire car. Okay, being a European car, parts and labour here in Australia, they probably will ask a premium. And as you're about to see, you may be requiring said parts and labour. But here's a hot tip. Quite often, the OEM parts aren't the way to go. We found quite a few times that aftermarket parts are generally cheaper and quite often last longer. And then when it comes to labour, guys, don't fall for this narrative that you've got to go to a, a Volkswagen dealership or even a European car specialist. Like, any experienced and licensed mechanic should be able to work on one of these, and that way you'll avoid any of the crazy prices the other guys charge. But if you really want to save money, get your hands dirty and work on these yourself to a certain degree. Look, maintenance with these is absolutely critical, and there is plenty of great advice out there to help you do the basic maintenance. And speaking of great advice, if you're looking at buying one of these or if you own one, join an owner's group. We did to do the research for this video and honestly, massive thank you to the Polo GTI owners groups. Phenomenal guys, huge advice. If you've got one of these, the advice and guidance they can give you will be priceless. Okay, time to break some hopes and dreams. What goes wrong with the Polo GTI? Let's start with the exterior. Okay, on some of the earlier diamond cut wheels, they can get this corrosion called white worm. The problem is to get them refurbished can be upwards of 200 bucks a rim. If the Polo GTI is fitted with a sunroof just like this, it is absolutely critical, guys, that all the drainage, like all the, the basically drainage holes and drainage channels are all cleared out. It can be a bit of a pain in the ass job. It's critical because if they're not cleared out, the water will go exploring, often inside some of the panels, and will eventually find electronics and then fry those electronics, and that's never a good thing. Okay, some owners have had problems with the reverse or the rear view camera, which normally for Volkswagen is up under there, but on these, it's kind of stuck on here. Issues like it glitching out, not working, and sometimes even kind of falling into that cavity. Then there are the various reports of electronic gremlins. Stuff like door lock actuators playing up, power windows and mirrors being weird, lights flickering and headlights burning through bulbs really quickly. Also, this is an affordable performance car, which often means inexperienced drivers buy them and then drive beyond the cars and their limits, and then also are often on a bit of a budget, so they tend to cut corners financially when it comes to repairs and maintenance. So it's critical that you go and watch our Ultimate Used Car Buyer's Guide to avoid any of these dramas when buying one. It could save you thousands. Okay, now inside, Sorry guys, it's just more electronic gremlins. Firstly, loads of owners have complained about issues with the infotainment systems. We're talking Bluetooth not connecting or dropping out, the screen's going black or glitching out, speakers not working, all sorts of really annoying problems. Then we're seeing more reports of like air conditioning systems fail. Sometimes it requires the entire evaporator to be replaced and that can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. But luckily here in Australia, it never gets hot, so you're probably never gonna need to use your air conditioning. Oh wait, hang on, no that's not right. Now the interior lighting, it can apparently like pulse and flicker and even fail, and not just this interior lighting, but like the lighting behind all the controls and the dash. Now according to a few other owners, the seatbelt clip can rub against the seat and just squeak, and apparently it's infuriating. Now the little clip that holds the armrest cover on, apparently it can break. Unfortunately the OEM part is stupidly expensive, but some of the cheap replacement parts on eBay are really bad quality. And finally, for interior issues, it's just loads of reports of rattles and squeaks and weird noises, generally coming from the pillars, also from behind the dashboard. It seems that every, every owner that we spoke to or you know, read through had a different kind of rattling experience. 
Now guys, if you'd like us to keep making this content for you, can you please hit the like and subscribe button, maybe go and follow us on Patreon, buy some merch and follow us on the socials. All of that sort of stuff, it allows us to make more videos for you. Okay, mechanically, what goes wrong with these? I'm, I'm so sorry guys, this is really gonna hurt if you're a fan of these cars. Well, I'm not gonna tell you, but because I'm not a mechanic, so I can't tell you, but Jim is, sorry. Now I know we're focusing on the GTI models with the 1.4 twin charge and the 1.8 turbo, but it's pretty safe to say that all of the problems I'm about to mention pretty much cover all of the Polo models. Now aside from the pretty common issues we see in all petrol Volkswagens of this age, that is engine breather issues, oil consumption, very fragile cooling systems and leaking water pumps and thermostat housings, they also suffer some, from some pretty serious problems. On the less serious side, you've got problems with intake flaps and uh, air regulator flaps. That's the bit that controls the bit between the turbo and the supercharger. They often play up. Next on the list, you've got things like the supercharger coupling or the clutch, which is also part of the water pump. Uh, now, quite often the water pump fails and the clutch pulley fails at the same time, and then that can take out the belt. Pretty messy down there. Then you get into the more expensive items like timing chain issues. They do tend to get a bit rattly and then they can just spontaneously jump teeth and then cause catastrophic engine failures. Very expensive. And even more expensive, these things have a habit of cracking pistons. Now there's a whole bunch of reasons why they do it and I'm not gonna get into that. They just crack and it's terrible. Uh, if you're lucky and you get it early when it's just presenting as a cylinder misfire, yeah, you can strip the motor down and put new pistons in it and there's upgraded ones and that can fix it. But if you don't get it in time and the piston cracks and breaks, it can damage the bore and the engine is a complete write-off. Now you might see in the comments somewhere where they say they've had one and never had any problems. I doubt it, but someone might write that. And you might be able to mitigate some of these problems by servicing it really well, but the truth is we see all of those problems happen on well-serviced units too. Basically, these things are unnecessarily complicated and expensive to fix. Now the later versions with the 1.8 turbo, it makes way more sense. They have way less problems. They still have problems, but a few less. They too suffer from very fragile cooling systems. And the water pumps in these fail all the time. And sometimes we see the genuine or brand new pumps fail with as little as 40,000 Ks on them. Quite often we replace them with aftermarket units, um, not just because they're much, much cheaper. Also, they last much longer. Oil consumption on these engines is a big problem. Some people are okay with that and they just top up their oil every few weeks and live with it. I mean, there are all the other ongoing problems with emissions and blocked up cats and fouled spark plugs, but by and large, some people are happy to live with it. But some people are not. And look, low oil and lubrication issues are bad on any engine, let alone this engine that is very prone to timing chain issues from lack of lubrication. If any engine really needs oil all the time, it's one of these. So yeah, the 1.8 is undoubtedly better than the 1.4 twin charge, but basically really it's the lesser of two evils. They're, they're both not great. Uh, onto the transmissions now, and if you can get a manual, the DSGs in these, especially in the early ones, are utter shit. Uh, a lot of mechatronics units and oil leaks and just complications everywhere. So if you can, definitely get the manual. Again, they're not perfect. They do have a few problems with the uh, dual mass flywheel and the clutches do tend to wear prematurely that that might be the operator. But yeah, the manual is a way better option. If you're looking to buy one or if you own one, you should definitely look at the recalls. There are a lot of recalls on these things. Now again, I've mentioned this before, recalls are not always a bad thing and sometimes they're just covering the manufacturer's ass against litigation. That's my opinion. But yeah, you should definitely check the recalls just for peace of mind. Another thing to keep in mind, a lot of younger enthusiasts like to buy these and modify them. You really should avoid any of these that have been modified, especially the 1.4s. But if you are buying one and it has had modifications, just do make sure the modifications have been done well. And if it has been tuned, make sure it's by a reputable tuner. Okay, so after all of that, should you buy one? Look, if we're talking about the pre-update, that's the 2010 to 2014 6R with the 1.4 litre, God no, do not buy one of those, they're terrible. Look, the 6R, it is a great little car, but it is let down by that shit show of an engine and an underwhelming gearbox. And even if you derive huge enjoyment from spending hours fixing stupid faults or spending every dollar you earn on spare parts, look, at least do that with an engine worthy of your commitment because this one isn't. But what about when it comes to this generation? Well, look, 
If it has a manual gearbox and you promise me that you're going to maintain it fastidiously and doing so isn't going to completely ruin you financially, it's a cautious, yeah, okay, buy one. Look, it is a great car, but you just have to know what you're getting yourself into. But what if it's one of these with a DSG transmission? Well, look, in that case, look, like thousands of owners, including Pete that owns this one, they have never and probably will never have an issue. But we have read a terrifying amount of reports from mechanics and owners that even GTIs maintained to the highest level still have had catastrophic DSG dramas, generally costing many thousands of dollars to fix. Look, personally, I just don't think the DSG is worth the risk. Plus, like learning how to change gears yourself, that's going to be less stressful and less painful than dealing with the DSG dramas that these things can have. So this then brings us to the question, do you buy Apollo GTI or do you get a Fiesta ST or a Clio RS or one of the other smaller? hot hatches let us know in the comments see you next time